The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. I'll get carried away listening to that all day. So uh, let's begin. Welcome to the STOA, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the STOA. And the STOA is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And what matters most is deep politics, because today we are very lucky to have Peter Dale Scott visiting the STOA. Uh, Peter is a former Canadian diplomat and professor of English at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's a poet, writer, researcher, and he researches something he calls deep politics. Uh, he wrote numerous books on the subject, uh, The Road to 9-11, The American War Machine, and more recently, The, the American Deep State. Um, and we haven't spoken much about politics at the STOA, but one of the, the themes here uh, has been understanding power and gaining uh, a literacy on, on, like a power literacy. And I think uh, deep politics, uh, understanding of deep politics is critical uh, for this. So how today is going to work if you're new here, um, if you have a question, so Peter is, uh, I'm going to take him in in a moment, and he's going to present his thoughts on deep politics. And if you have any, or anytime I'm asking him questions, write in the chat, put like a cue or question before your question, I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question to Peter. This will be on YouTube, and if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that in the chat somehow. So that being said, I will allow Peter to unmute himself and take him in. How is it going, my friend? Well, first of all, I want to say how glad I am to be talking to an audience through Toronto because uh, I was born in Montreal. My last uh, long time in, was actually at the University of Toronto. So in a funny way, I feel I'm coming home, even though I'm sitting down here in a, a fire clouded sky with the soot falling out of the air and cars driving with headlights in the middle of the day. Makes me nostalgic for, for Canada. Uh, I uh, slightly misremembered I definitely prefer to talk about deep politics, which is a term I believe I coined. I took it out of parapolitics originally uh, in my first real book on this topic. And parapolitics I dis defined as a system of politics in which responsibility or accountability is consciously diminished. And of course, in saying that, what I had in mind were activities of the CIA covert operations, uh, false flag operations, where you want to do something, but you don't want to be recognized as the author of it. But the more I thought about this, I felt that there was a great deal going on in the world that uh, transcended uh, the idea of conscious thing and I gave the example of Italy after the war where the parapolitics involved was that the Americans had in instituted a, a, well the Allies I should say the AMGOT the Allied military government of Italy and the man running it Charles Poletti came out of Tammany Hall in New York had a long history with working with the Mafia in New York and installed Vito Genovese, who was a high-ranking uh, uh, Mafia member, from American, in his office in Rome. And the purpose of this was that the Mafia had been one of the very few groups that Mussolini had not completely suppressed in opposition, and the Americans were now building up the Mafia as, uh, an, opposi as an opposition to the Communists. That was parapolitics. But what happened was that the Mafia gained a kind of status in Italy, which went way beyond what the Americans had intended. And so you had a situation where the Mafia 
was able to um, penetrate uh, law enforcement and uh, the, the result went way beyond any conscious intentions and that was the first place where I looked at deep politics. And uh, since then, I have uh, thought about how in America, something very similar has happened because um, you had uh, Americans in power, both, both in the government and also in corporate uh, places like Henry Ford, for example, the mafia was very use, useful to them because they wanted to uh, fight union organization and particularly after World War II, they wanted to fight communists in the unions and they involved the mafia to do this. So what, be, and again, what began as a parapolitical move to uh, have an underworld ally in a fight against the communists developed into a situation where the mafia got control of certain unions and became a major problem, which uh, that's how Bobby Kennedy first became famous, was in investigating uh, underworld, underworld control of unions. And uh, I think out of the, I've uh, now, you know, deep politics is not a very fashionable term but a term that is very fashionable now, thanks to Trump, is the deep state. Um, it's, it's one of the, it, 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 and that term actually came out of uh, Turkey. And I, I think it's relevant for me to mention that uh, how it began, I believe, was a, a car crash in, Italy, in Turkey in 1996. With, it was a Mercedes traveling at very high speed, and the, all of the members were extremely interesting. There was the deputy chief of the police, Istanbul Police Department, and a member of parliament, and then a, a, a very sexy actress. And the fourth person was Abdullah Chatli, who was an international heroin trafficker, and uh, and. Um, uh, a reasonably frequent killer who had been recruited by the Turkish police for special missions and paid in heroin at the same time that he was being sought by the Turkish authorities for murder. Now that kind of doubleness, and here they all are in the same car, law enforcement is looking for Chatley, but meanwhile one member of law enforcement is in a car with him uh, along with the actress and uh, that is the, uh, to explain this situation, the Turkish prime minister came up with the term deep state. And he said that in Turkey, we have a, a regular state and we have a deep state. And unfortunately the deep state is more powerful than the state. And that, that is uh, the origins of the term and the way deep state is used in America now is being bowdlerized. The, the underworld part of it is not usually mentioned. But when I started using the term deep state to illustrate what I mean deep, by deep politics, uh, precisely that doubleness that you have on the one hand, you have a part of the government that is fighting crime, but you have other elements in society, both inside the government and, and I would say particularly the CIA here, and also outside the government in corporations that are using the forces which are simultaneously part of the government is looking for. And uh, I want to say a bit more about that because uh, that my definition of the deep state has always involved not, let me begin with the way it's being used over and over and over in the American media now. It's the Trump view of it, or it's officials in Washington he doesn't like, particularly in officials in Washington who are investigating him, as I think they properly should have been. The FBI appropriately investigated his Russian connections. And I think we're about to learn a good deal more about those because uh, what Michael Cohen, his lawyer, his book, the book came out yesterday 
and talks about a house in my in Palm Beach that uh, Trump was unable to sell. Nobody wanted it, and suddenly a Russian oligarch came along and paid fifty million dollars over the asking price, so that Trump made a profit of fifty million dollars by selling this house to a Russian oligarch. That looks very much, and and that's what Michael Cohen says. It was a way, really, for uh, Putin to pass $50 million to Trump and also gain a kind of purchase over Trump because of the $50 million. That is definitely deep politics. And uh, it, you might say it's power politics too. Uh, but it's a situation we've been living in and we have been deluged by Trump and Trump supporters talking about the FBI and the CIA as if they were the deep state. Well, of course, for me, the deep state is those, but the, C, the, the CIA's function in the deep state is partly because of its status in Washington, but partly because of its origins where it was really lobbied for by Wall Street and the Council on Foreign Relations and the special power of Washington, of the CIA in Washington is not just that it has been, there is a charter which has given him uh, it powers. We've never seen that charter, by the way. We know that the National Security Act said that it sh could engage, and I think the quote is such activities as, uh, the, as the, the government may from time to time direct. That we know there's a charter which says more and we know from the history of how the CIA was created, Truman didn't want it. He was lobbied for it in 1945 by the veterans of the, its predecessor, the Organization's Special Services, the OSS during World War II. And uh, Hoover didn't want a CIA. He wanted to be the monopoly chief of uh, dirty tricks and secret operations. And uh, thanks to a maneuver by Hoover in 1945, Truman was persuaded to close down the OSS. But then the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and particularly Alan Dulles, who at that point had left OSS and was now a lawyer back in back Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. And he said there should be a CIA, he drew up a memo and to, I'm condensing a lot of history here, but by 1947, there was a CIA and Truman made a point of always appointing somebody who came from the Midwest, not from New York, because he mistrusted what was going to happen. But right underneath the director, almost all of the uh, deputy directors were coming, came not only from Wall Street, but were also in the New York Social Register. They were, you could say, aristocratic New Yorkers. And the CIA, for the first half of its life, represented that kind of presence in Washington and in the deep politics of America. But it, its connections with New York were perhaps as important, if not more so, than its connections with Washington. And that, in a weird way, is still true, even though now the president is from New York and he's attacking the CIA in Washington. Um, there is, the deep state that I'm talking about uh, has always had, it's always been divided between uh, the internationalists like the, the Council on Foreign Relations, the, uh, the CFR, and nationalists mostly from central United States who mistrust the connection to Europe, think that America's real destiny is to be involved in Latin America and maybe the Far East. And the, there was, the, in the 30s, there was a conflict, a deep political conflict between the um, Council on Foreign Relations, the bankers, the in international lawyers in New York, and the National Association of Manufacturers. And 10 of the latter in 1957 <coughs> got together at the home of a candy manufacturer 
and 11 people who invented something called the John Birch Society, which in the 50s was a fringe group, and even in the 60s was uh, much mocked in the um, American media, particularly, excuse me, <clears throat> particularly when it turned out that the head of the uh, Birch Society had told a meeting that he thought that Dwight Eisenhower was a, uh, was a de dedicated agent or representative of the Communist Party. This seemed so off the wall that people kind of laughed at the John Birch Society. And then, you know, one man, uh, Goldwater in 1964, uh, ran with John Birch Society for support for a president and was absolutely demolished. And people thought that, well, that's the end of the threat to the internationalists from the John Birch Society. And how wrong they were because, and I'm con condensing history here, but by 1980, really the, uh, the, John, the, the Goldwater element in the Republican Party had completely defeated the, what we call the Nelson Rockefeller international element of the Republican Party. And the Republican Party was set on the course where we see it today, where it was captured progressively first by the Tea Party, which was a fringe group, but a well-sponsored, well-financed fringe group financed by the Koch brothers, who at that time were running the largest privately owned uh, oil firm, and I think perhaps the largest privately owned corporation in America, who put hundreds of millions of politics behind the Tea Party, and out of the ruins of the, of the Tea Party dominated Republican Party, then you got Trump. Behind all of this, there's been deep politics because of the ongoing uh, contest for the future of America between people who essentially want an orderly, uh, law abiding, uh, uh, economy and system versus people who make their fortune by breaking laws. Uh, Trump himself being an example by that. His, his, his fortune such as it is based on a series of bankruptcies. His um, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, comes from a family which once paid a 20 million, whose cor family corporation paid a $20 million fine for having uh, violated federal laws. So we have a rather chaotic situation in America now, uh, but I think there's something that is very important both to deep politics and the deep state that I haven't mentioned yet are the international oil companies. And they're in a category by themselves because uh, they um, try to be good citizens in America, but they try also, incidentally, not to pay any taxes so that they, uh, all their profits are made by subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands or, or uh, Bahamas. But abroad, they succeed by, uh, you know, the State Department will go in and in introduce democracy in a country, and then the oil companies will go in, take uh, uh, New Guinea-Bissau, for example, in Africa, uh, and they will pour a, a few million dollars into corrupting the president, and then they get all the oil leases for, they don't want a democracy where they would have to pay off everybody, they want a dictator where they just have to pay off one man, and the oil companies have been working pretty systematically against the stated objective uh, political goals of American international politics, which is to spread democracy, because the, um, the, uh, the oil companies uh, thrive best in a country where they, they, they with the Congo, for example, under Chombi. Uh, the uh, it was uh, it was uh, it, it it's happening all over the world. Uh, so I don't know how much longer I should go on talking, Peter. Um,
I'm, I was hoping somebody would have asked a question by now. Yeah, yeah so um, yeah, I'll jump in and ask you a few questions. And if anyone has a question, throw it in the chat box and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, I just like um, maybe a personal question first, uh, out of interest, uh, you were a professor uh, in English and you're yes. a poet. Uh, like how do you get into the, all this like deep politics stuff? Like what was your entry point or what was okay. the catalyst? All right, well, I'll add to that, that I have a PhD in political science. But uh, I got it from McGill, and uh, I wanted to write a PhD on the political ideas of Hegel. And uh, I'm also a poet. They said, no, no, you can't, you'll never get a job if you write about Hegel, which, by the way, was a bad prediction. Hegel is now a legitimate topic. But I, so they said, who, I said, who else can they, I write on? They said, anyone you like. I said, T.S. Eliot. And they said, well, much better than Hegel. So I wrote a PhD on T.S. Eliot, and thank goodness I did that because I was very unhappy. I don't believe in political, that political science is a science, and I used to say that in the department and would be hushed for saying something so sacrilegious. But by, without ever intending, it, it, got, it got me a job in the English department. And from there, I, I'm going to tell you this because it's really quite relevant. I be, I, my diplomatic service had exposed me to a situation in Indochina. If you will remember, some people may remember that back in the 50s, there was a Geneva conference to bring peace to Indochina. There were a set of, Indone of Geneva Accords and the three countries appointed to uh, supervise the success of the accords were first of all India and then Canada and then Poland and my I was uh, sent off to Poland as a third secretary I was the lowest man in the embassy and that meant I had to read all these dreary piles of uh, cables that came in dealing with Indochina and I never remembered what was in those cables when I left but I did come away with the feeling that Indochina was a situation that the West should stay out of, let, let them settle their own future. And when America started to get involved in 1961, uh, I started lobbying, even though I had just arrived in Berkeley, I started almost immediately to tell people not to get involved. I signed the one petition and then another petition came and I rewrote it and then I talked into China in a class in the speech department where I was at the time. And then um, some, a pro-war group wanted to debate somebody and I was the person they chose to debate. And that made me when, become the first anti-war speaker on the Berkeley campus. And I've, uh, that, that got me involved in the Kennedy assassination because I was very struck by the fact, which by the way was a concealed fact, but a deep fact and for a long time that Kennedy was starting to withdraw troops from Indochina in 63. And uh, then he was assassinated on November 22nd. And four days later, there was a new uh, National Security Action Memorandum, which annulled the withdrawal and started the buildup. And that's what got me involved in the whole notion of deep politics. Mm. So that's a long answer to a very simple question. Um, so I have another question, then we'll pivot to the, uh, the questions in the chat. Uh, you write something about deep um, events, uh, September 11th, um, the JFK assassination and others. Could you maybe give an overview of what that is? Yes. Um, I. I, I spent the best part of a decade researching the Kennedy assassination. And then when Watergate came along, I was struck by the phenomenon that some of the names I had actually written about in connection with the Kennedy assassination uh, were involved in, the, in Watergate, including one of the Watergate burglars. I had already written about him. And it was the week my book came out with that part suppressed at the request of the publisher, uh, there was the man I had written about on the front page of the New York Times because he had just broken into Watergate. 
And then we had Iran Contra in the 1980s. And I have to tell you, there were quite a few names involved in Iran Contra that I had, especially Cuban names, that I had investigated in connection with the Kennedy assassination. And then finally, we had 9-11. Uh, and by then, I knew enough about things that had happened before to see, and, and if anyone's interested in this, I have a whole section about similarities between the Kennedy assassination and 9-11 in my book, American War Machine, which is a badly titled book. It's really about uh, uh, the, the underside of American politics in America. So um, I am convinced that there are patterns that recur. And I actually predicted, by the way, in the mid 90s, I predicted that we seem to have a deep event about every decade and I would not be surprised if we don't have another one. And that was four or five years before 9-11. And uh, so I think that deep events are the part of the way that uh, the deep politics of America and the regular politics of America are controlled by what I call the deep state. So you know, yes, they go. And then finally, you can add the notion of deep history that along with the sort of chron the chronicles of political events that we read in the papers and then get in political science textbooks, there's a whole other history of America going on which I try to indicate the bare outlines of in my book, The American Deep State, which is perhaps, that will certainly be my last book on this topic. I'm now writing about the Dark Ages, which is a, a much gentler and, and more promising, more optimistic topic, so far as I'm concerned, than writing about the politics of our present century. Uh, okay, so we're gonna to turn to the chats. Um... Victor, you got a few plus ones if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, thank you. So um, what I'm thinking back to is, uh, so on the Stoa, Daniel Schmachtenberger's appeared a couple of times. One time was... Speak loudly. I'm, I'm, I'm deaf and I don't hear very well. Uh, and I don't speak very loudly, so that makes us a bad couple. Um, <laughs> so, there's, uh, so Daniel Schmachtenberger has been on the show show on this uh, the the stoa previously and has suggested ways to leverage political structures in order to preserve some of our um world resources you know like the uh like the amazon i had wondered like do you see any ways to use political solutions to solve uh, some of our existential problems? Oh, that's a huge, that's what I'm writing about now. I've withdrawn from uh, narrow 21st century issues to uh, considerations about our culture. Yes, you know, politics, I, I do believe that politics should be and can be and have been the solution to major problems. I think the American Revolution, for example, when I was a, when I was a child and lived in Canada, I had a kind of uh, anti-American perspective on it. But now I think it was the, the idea of establishing a government where obligation is to a piece of paper, the constitution, rather than to a person, the king, was a revolutionary idea which changed not just America, but the world. And I, you know, I think we've seen a, a wave of constitutions now that basically, uh, probably more than half of them are not observed very carefully. There's a constitution in China and Russia and even North Korea but the idea that we are ruled by law and not by people is an idea that gained immensely. And we have many problems which I will need to be addressed, I think, on an international level. I'm a, I have to say, I'm, I think it's because I'm a Canadian and was in the Foreign Service under Lester Pearson. Well, just as I came in, I had nine days under Lester Pearson and then 
nine days after I came in, the government fell, but not, not because of me. And uh, the, still we had a kind of globalist approach and uh, the, the United Nations expeditionary force to solve the, uh, the crisis, the Suez crisis in the 50s was an example of Lester Pearson democracy, which I believed in and I would like to see more of. And we'll need international solutions to global warming. Obviously, that's very high on the agenda. And I never got to say it, but obviously, the people who stand, among the people who stand to lose most from serious measures to fight, uh, deal with climate change are going to be the international oil companies. They know it's coming. They're already diversifying into wind and solar and so on, but they want to pump as much of their resources out of the ground as they can, so they delay and they, they are among the big lawbreakers, I would say now, uh, in many ways, the big opponents of a rational solution to our problems. I can't tell you how we will find a political solution, and I'm a poet, and I've noticed that good poets often have had very bad politics, including T.S. Eliot, who I wrote about. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the formula, but yes, I do believe that politics, you said, I think, political structures. I, I see politics as a process. I even see uh, the deep state as a process, not a structure. And even regular states, uh, the, the America, this, American state has changed so much since I first came here in 1961. I think we should always be thinking in terms of processes and how to uh, direct them more closely towards their proper goals. Uh, there are many ways and, and that I'm a pessimist, but deep down I think I'm an optimist about politics, if that's an answer to your question. Thank you. Peter Jones, you had uh, a question. Oh, thanks. I'll unmute. Hi, Peter. I'm appreciating uh, the conversation. I'm an American that moved up to um, Canada, to Toronto, uh, partly because of, I consider myself a political refugee, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a conscientious objector, not because I was being drafted, but my taxes from a successful business were paying for an illegal war in Iraq. And have been happy up in Canada ever since. Um, and so given, um, uh, and I also want to comment that um, I'd like to find your poetry. My favorite poets are anti-war poets like uh, Kenneth Patchen and uh, William Butler, Butler Yeats and, yeah. and Eliot, but uh, Patchen was uh, very clearly one. Um, I have a question about your, I want to ask about your sense of the relationship between the U.S. Um, U.S. deep state politics and global power in the sense of how do you view the underlying differences between a nationalist oriented politics that is explicitly moving away from um, from global integration and the and the global or uh, world government orientation. I mean, in terms of process, is this is this uh, something of a you know of a, uh, you know of a Leviath of a conflict between, you know, leviathans and hegemonies? Is this, uh, I mean, John Ralston Saul has written about this like 10 years ago because he's always early. Um, but I wanted to uh, get your sense of how kind of the deepsters uh, that, you know, in the permanent government, as I call it, are, are, um, are right now seem to be uh, in a massive existential argument over those directions. Well, my, uh, you know, when my uh, book, The American Deep State, came out in France, I wrote a special preface for it. And if you can read French, uh, I think my, my answer is partly expressed there. I talk there about an international deep state and the, what I, see as being the dominant force in American deep politics in the, 19, in the 20th century, the last century, which was 
the Council on Foreign Relations, its links to the CIA, which it helped create. Uh, those people con connected also with the Royal Institute of International Affairs in Britain. And there was something called Le Cercle Piné, or often called just Le Cercle, the circle. Uh, it's a group of uh, financiers and bankers and former intelligence, chiefs of intelligence. Uh, they, they have a high impression of themselves. One of their documents took credit for the installation of Margaret Thatcher as prime minister in Britain. And I have uh, seriously investigated. They had a meeting, they normally meet in Europe, usually in France. But in 1963, they met, I've never written this, but I'm going to share it here. In 1963, the summer, they met at Pocantico, which was the Rockefeller residence just outside of New York City. And they discussed what they this was, I think, listed as the, the question of John F. Kennedy. And uh, some people have suspected that what they were actually discussing was the assassination of Kennedy. And I have to say that I went by accident to a right wing dinner in July of 63 uh, down here in California at the home of a Canadian who was then running the very right wing uh, Hoover Institution at, at Stanford. I was there because I had just come from Poland and I knew a lot of Polish officers here in Berkeley, not a lot, one or two. And uh, they, they liked me and they liked the chance to speak Polish with me. They took me to this dinner and it was the most right-wing dinner I've ever heard. And everybody was talking about the problem of Kennedy and I swear to God, this is in David Talbot's book about uh, Dulles, that um, they were all saying, what are we going to do? And then an amazing man, very striking. He was a, a, a Jesuit uh, dressed as an Orthodox because he was actually a Uniate uh, uh, Jesuit. That means he was in that part of the Orthodox church which is affiliated to Rome and not to Moscow, a very exotic background. And he did say in July 63, don't worry, the old man will take care of it. And that probably, probably affected my interest. I didn't actually uh, connect that to my motivation, but I'm sure that deep down that got me worrying. So anyway, there are these deep, uh, to come back to the circle, there, there are these deep uh, institutions on an international level. And of course, uh, right all over the globe now, we're not just in America uh, or Britain, but we're seeing a kind of uh, reaction away from globalism, which I think has to do with the fact that the first wave of globalism promised more than it delivered, and it ignored the problems of people who were suffering. And uh, Trump, Trump, in a sense, is an accident. No one foresaw saw him coming. He himself didn't expect to win. But unquestionably, he was smart enough to voice the rather uh, unsophisticated opinions of the people who were not being served well by the kind of neoliberal uh, Washington consensus that we had. And as myself, as somebody who does believe in politics and believes in global solutions, never believed in the neoliberal Washington consensus. So I think it's done a lot of harm to this. It's done a harm to America. It's done great harm to the world. Uh, we have to rethink how we use our resources much more carefully. Uh, but all the, uh, to come back to your question, which was, I think, uh, is there some kind of pattern? Say your question again. Well, well, you've addressed really the whole first part of it about the dynamics and some of the sources, but, um, but I'm curious about kind of the battle royale that might be going on now between 
between trends in US that we're just seeing the symptoms of for a movement towards greater in, uh, toward international integration, um, free trade, trade treaties, um, um, uh, uh, connections between you know, the G8 trying to, you know, and I mean, mm -hmm. this is basically the anti-Russia uh, people and then those, are the, and they want to integrate China and they don't want to have Russia and China come together in, into a Eurasian bloc. Right. And the nationalists probably don't care about that so much because they seem, one of the positive things might be that if countries can go their own way, there might not be this global coercion to maintain unipower or unipolar power of the U.S. being the hegemon for the next 20 years? Well, you know, if you asked me this question after November the 3rd, uh, I would be in a, able to give you a better answer. I do think that if uh, Trump loses, uh, I'm not sure Trump will lose the presidency, but I'm pretty sure he'll lose the election. Uh, we are really having to think about what Trump is going to do if he, do if he does lose the election, and he's indicated that he has special powers up his sleeve, and I've done enough research to know that that's very true, and I'm trying to get Congress with, with some friends, trying to mobilize Congress to end the state of emergency. We're, we're still in a state of emergency declared after 9-11, and uh, that I have said in my last three books, we've got to terminate this emergency. Congress is required by law to consider it uh, within six months, uh, but they don't do it. It's renewed after year after year. Uh, this whole question, and I'm getting sidetracked though. If we see an end to the Trump era, America is still powerful enough in the world. It's not as powerful as it was, but I think it's still powerful enough that if uh, Biden does what he says he's going to do, and restores uh, working through NATO and tries to solidify connections with the European Union, um, you might see a, a, a short-term revival of internationalism. Uh, my feeling is that uh, that's not certain, but what is certain is that in the long term, we're either going to get a revival of internationalism or we're going to see a complete breakdown of, of, of the world polity. Uh, and, you know, there are some people who see China as uh, hopeful in this, some people who see it as an enemy. You know, if, if you listen to Xi, the things he says are quite good. You know, the, Graham Allison uh, wrote something about what he called the Thucydides trap because Thucydides has a sentence in his history of the Peloponnesian War where he says that uh, the, the war was necessitated when Sparta saw that uh, Athens was becoming a, a rival. And it suggested a kind of necessity to a competition between an older and a rising rival leads to war. And Graham Allison said, you know, we studied 20 instances of this and 16 of them, it did result in war and only four it didn't. What he didn't stress in his article was that all four of them that where it didn't have been in the last century and three of the last four have been in the last 20 years. And Xi Jinping is aware of Graham Allison's article and more than once he has said, we don't need to have a Thucydides trap. He has said we should work towards a multipolar world, which is exactly what Kissinger was trying to do under Nixon, and which I think, you know, there are some very bad things about Kissinger, but I think Kissinger was a genius in a way. I think he helped, contributed to the liberation of Eastern Europe by the Helsinki Accords of the 70s. That's in my book, The Road to 9-11. And yes, it should be a multipolar world. And sooner or later, it's going to be a, a either it's going to be a multipolar world or it's going to be a world in ashes because we can't go on avoiding nuclear war forever not when we get more and more powers 
and even perhaps now uh, uh, independent actors like, you know, who knows if the ISIS survives and had survived, it could have developed a nuclear capacity itself. So uh, we're, we're both have had a, a, a century of remarkable luck in avoiding nuclear war, but we have been so close to nuclear war more than once, including in Vietnam and certainly in the missile crisis. We're lucky to be here and it's urgent to do something about it. And so I do hope that uh, Biden is elected. Um, I, I, I see no hope for what I think is a really crucial problem here is that America has to stop relying so much on its military strength to project its influence and to rely more on its soft power, which is uh, its real power. I think that uh, the, the soft power of America, its cultural influence around the world, including Russia and China, is, is an underused resource and the military option is one which is, it's, it's filling the world with armaments. We sell, every time we sell a new batch of arms to Saudi Arabia, they have these old arms which they then give to their clients and some of those end up with the terrorists. And um, so all of that is very clear to me. It's unfortunately, I think, not very clear to the Democratic Party. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done even if Biden is elected. But I think the short-term hopes for a return to globalism <coughs> are reasonably good. And as I say, the long-term, it's either globalism or it's destruction. So um, we just have to work very hard for globalism. All right. Um, so this might be your last question. Uh, Christian, you had a, a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, for joining. Um, my question is um, around the uncertainty that um, I think a lot of people are feeling in the upcoming election, what might happen in the scenario of a crisis in the, in the integrity of the election. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, what the continuity of government is as a, it, what, what part of the deep state it forms and how that, how it might be a player in a scenario like that where um, there was some uncertainty or difficulty in the election? Thank you, that's a very good question. I, I really meant to talk about continuity of government, then I realized it's an international audience, but it is very irrelevant. At the heart of 9-11, the most important thing that happened on 9-11 was the institution of a set of rules the suspension of habeas corpus, the establishment of military, the US military uh, command in the domestic United States and, uh, and various other kinds of controls. They were very secret rules that had been very uh, carefully planned for 20 years. Uh, well, actually longer, but in the last 20 years, they had been planned by two men a, a, a group of people instituted by Reagan in 1982, partly from inside the government and partly from outside the government. And uh, for the last six, for the, it was initially to deal with an atomic attack. If, if the country is decapitated, if a bomb, uh, if, 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 uh, if Washington sit, was hit by a nuclear weapon, and you lost not only the president, but all of the people who are in the constitutional line of succession, what do you do? And these are a set of rules which were summarized by more than one person quite accurately, I think, as suspension of the constitution. The two people who worked very hard on this planning were uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who at the time was head of a pharmaceutical corporation, and Donald Cheney, who for the last six years was the head of Halliburton, which was developing oil, American oil companies in Central Asia. And on 9-11, before the last plane went down, uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld, in the absence of uh, 
of, of uh, Bush, who was on a plane flying to Louisiana, they instituted, they implemented continuity of government. I've had two favorable reviews of my book about this, they say that I speculate this. No, it's a fact. It's an, it's an under-reported fact that's in the 9-11 Commission report, along with an expl explanation that they uh, knew that there were other things happening on 9-11, but the, only the chairman and the vice chairman and Philip Zel Zelico, the executive director, got to see any of the documentation about the continuity of government. Well, anyway, those rules were implemented on September the 11th, and I think they were made permanent under the state of emergency that was two of them actually declared three days later. And uh, we know they've continued because uh, George W. Bush amended them in 2007, when he renewed the state of emergency, he referred to various classified uh, am amendments to the continuity of government rules, uh, which again, nobody's been able to see. In fact, the House committee that was in charge of, of Homeland Security asked to see them and was told he was not able to see them because he didn't have an eye enough clearance which meant he didn't have a clearance for COG matters. That's why I think it's, and, and Trump, I think, well, Trump has renewed the, the COG, I should say the state of emergency three times. So he obviously knows about them. And when he says, I have, seek, I have special powers, I think that's what he's referring to, the power to suspend the constitution. So, uh, your question, I think, is, it's my question. Can, can, can anything be done about this before the election? And uh, I, I have to tell you, I, I root, teamed up with my friend Daniel Ellsberg. We went to our um, representative in Congress, who's Barbara Lee, the only person to vote against the Patriot Act, which embodied a lot of the COG uh, uh, provisions into law, and she, uh, her staff have forwarded it to the Judicial Committee of the House, and it's sitting there right now, the idea that they should look at this, and we're being told, but no, we've got to get, we have to raise funds to uh, go on supporting the unemployed when the, you know, the, the current wave of support ran out on July 31st, so they say there are more important things. My answer is there are 435 members of Congress. There must be one member of Congress who could take it upon himself to pursue this matter and get something done on it. And uh, we'll just have to see if the Washington, which we have to certainly admit is in very great disarray right now. It's, it's not a well-functioning apparatus, the system of government in Washington. Can they handle this or not? I, my answer is I don't know. I hope so. All right. Um, so we're uh, reaching the hour. I just wanted to give you any um, opportunity to say final words, um, Peter, anything you'd like to leave us off with? Uh, well, I want to say I'm glad to, uh, I think I was hearing both from Canadians and Americans and from Peter Jones appealed to me because my last extended time in Canada was when I was a visiting lecture, writer, writer in residence at the University of Toronto in 92. And I saw all my old friends, or had a lot of old friends, but I made a lot of new friends and most of them were people like you who had crossed the border from America to Canada. And I, it, it, it intensified my own sense of being a cross border border crosser in the opposite direction. And um, I, I, I think that uh, I'm glad the STOA had this event because I think that we have to spend less time uh, thinking about politics the way we read it in the newspapers and spend more time thinking about it in the context of economics and all these other things that are happening under the surface because urgent solutions are needed to these terrible problems we face 
I mean, the COVID is, 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 is one of these problems and is, well, I won't go there, that's a whole new topic, but just global warming has grown out of the unregulated behavior of the oil companies, which is one of the shocking scandals of the 20th century. And you can only, we don't get their records, so we have to understand their behavior by deep political analysis. And as I say, I think the world needs this and I see more and more of it. So in that sense, I'm also, I'm hopeful. Thank you very much, Peter, for arranging this. Beautiful. Uh, I'll make some closing announcements in a, in a moment, but uh, Peter, thank you so much for visiting the STOA today um, and sharing your thoughts on deep politics. Um, so closing an announcements, uh, I'll, I'll plug some uh, events coming up. Uh, we have Joe Norman uh, coming in tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern time to talk about complied complexity. Um, I'll plug a fun event coming up. Uh, Susan Blackmore, uh, mimetic uh, scholar, uh, author of The Meme Machine. She's coming in to do an event called Conscious, Conscious of Selfish Genes and Meme Machines. Uh, that's September 24th, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And, and Peter Jones, uh, who's in the room, he's a professor at OCAD. He's doing a lot of interesting things. You have an event coming up, but... Uh, could I tag you in to maybe uh, if you can plug it uh, personally? Oh, uh, I don't need to say too much, but uh, thanks for, for mentioning what's uh, October 6th, um, a Tuesday on, on uh, living in, uh, so it's about living in the complex world that we're in that has formed um, out, of, out of a condition um, described as the global problematique. Uh, from the Club of Rome. So going back, I think, um, going back 50 years and considering the 50th anniversary of the meeting of the Club of Rome that led to the Limits, Limits to Growth project, um, I'm going to talk about the project that was rejected by the Club of Rome that was based on Hassan Ozbekan's uh, syst systemic model of the global problematique, which is still with us and still as much present as the limits to growth. And we focus so much on the kind of quantitative, uh, technocratic approach to, um, even to even to climate and social issues that were representative of limits to growth. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna look at the stakeholder, the, you know, the, the stakeholder driven approach, which is how Ozbekan wanted to address uh, the, same, the same crisis. And, uh, and that's what a lot of my work is around. So awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That yeah, good be, discussion today. Yeah. That should be super fun. Um, for more events, you can go to the stoa.ca. If you'd like to support us, you can visit us on Patreon. Uh, uh, any support you can give would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we'd love to keep doing more events like this during this crazy time that we're living in. That being said, uh, Peter, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you so much. Mwah. Have a great day. Great night. <laughs>